is everyone okay with question one? You more or less know what you're going to be doing there, eh? We're going to be doing a little bit more on question one, that question out of 15, where you talk about knowledge and truth. Remember this morning I said to you, um, if, it's, if it's known, does it make it true? And because it is knowledge, is it true or is knowledge true or is truth knowledge? So it sounds like contradictory, but think about all of these things. Think about a belief system, guys. Because we believe in something, does it make it true? Okay, I'm, I'm just asking you to ask that question. Okay, and because knowledge is fact, is it truth? Not necessarily, because think about the 16th century. Perfect example. Knowledge was that the Earth was flat. Correct. It, it was a factual statement. Everyone know, knew that to be true, but yet it was disproved. Okay, there are still some conspiracy theorists out there that say man has never ever landed on the moon. That that was all one big hoax. Have you heard about those theories? Yes. Okay, so that is a knowledge base. We believe that the moon is out there and that man has landed on the moon a couple of times. But how do we prove it? Do you know that blew, what uh, blew me away? Um, my boy, he's nine years old now and he loved dinosaurs. Absolutely loves dinosaurs, loves the bones. What do we, what do we call that? Paleon, paleontology, correct? Paleontology. So he loved digging up bones, etc., etc. And I was watching this one particular documentary with him on dinosaurs. And according to this documentary, um, they were saying that 5% of dinosaur bones is factual and the rest is speculative. It's quite scary. Look, as I said, I don't know, some people might disagree with those facts, but it just shows you. So they get data together and they speculate about how the dinosaur looked. We don't know, but an authority figure stands up and says, this is what a dinosaur was. This is how a dinosaur looked. You know, T-Rex, they now say that a T-Rex wasn't this big meat eater. So now this is, can anybody disprove it? No. But Hollywood has shown us, we're saying, no, gee, what's a T-Rex? Look what a T-Rex can do. It can pick up a car and it can do that. But we don't know what a T-Rex could do. So a lot of it is just speculative. So it comes back to statistical information. How much of that information is speculative? And how much of it is theory-based? Okay. Right, guys, page 44. Issues in questionnaire design and surveys. Why are we spending time on this particular section? because it's related back to question two. What is question two about again? Just show you there. Uh, compile a questionnaire of at least 10 questions. So it doesn't only have to be 10 questions, but of at least 10 questions. Before we can get to the questionnaire, we have to look at semantics once again. What type of semantics do we have to look at? Look at what is knowledge? What is knowledge? What is truth? What is value? What is intrinsic value? What is instrumental value? So we're gonna be going through those. Look at the uh, page 44 there, it says statistics can go wrong. <laughs> Isn't that lovely? Opening line. Statistics can go wrong. A lot of us think, no, it's fact because the stats show. They can go wrong as well. I am not talking selective statistics to ensure that I would get what I want, but rather a case of mistaken objective. And I want to spend time on this particular case study uh, that they did on Coca-Cola. I'm going to ask Bianca just to read through for me. Is that right? Are you feeling okay? Right, and it says, when Donald Keogh, now this gent was from Coca-Cola, thank you. When Donald Keogh was in charge of Coca-Cola, they did a, t a tasting survey between the Coke recipe as it was at the time and an improved recipe. The qualitative survey was done over a population sample of about 200,000 people, of which more than 99% preferred the taste of the improved recipe. Although something was niggling in the back of his mind, all the figures showed thumbs up for the new Coca-Cola. It was decided to go ahead with the launch. Following the launch, Coca-Cola received more than 400,000 complaints in one month. Isn't that unbelievable? So what they're talking about here from a questionnaire point of view, they designed their whole questionnaire around what? Taste of the new Coke. Around taste. And if you've got a product, how long has Coke been around for? Long time. Isn't there something else that goes hand in hand with a product that has been around for so long? Is it all about ta taste? Is it all about quality? Or is it maybe also something around culture? I don't know. But they found this out very quickly. And what, it, what they said there is sommeliers were serving old Coke in the wine basket that used to contain the best wine of the house and said to people, this is still the real stuff. The real stuff. 
Then on a day, Kioch said, uh, spoke to an elderly lady who was very upset that Coke, as she knew it, had been replaced. Replying to Kioch's question as to when last she actually drank Coke, she replied that it was about 25 years ago that she last drank Coke, but she was still upset about them changing it. And she said, but that, that was not the issue. The real issue was that she had grown up with Coke. It was part of her life memories. Isn't that quite scary? Mm. So we draw up these questionnaires. We get this data in, but then the data is actually skewed. It's actually not telling us anything. Even though 200,000 people, 99% of those 200,000 people said, yes, we like the new Coke. It actually failed. Why? Because how many people are actually drinking that Coke? And maybe it's a cultural, it's those memories that are important in that particular scenario as well. Interesting, eh? So we have to be very, very careful how we design our questions, how we draw our questions up. Look at that next one. It says, what is knowledge? Can I ask, uh, Mandy, won't you read for us, please? This theme has been designed to guide you through some elements of the theory of knowledge with a minimum fuss. It starts off with defining types of knowledge and explores some topics in the theory of knowledge as well as the question of the value of knowledge. Section 2.1 and 2.2 of this theme are based on the book. What is the thing called knowledge by du Duncan, Duncan Pritchard. Pritchard, okay. Right, guys, now remember all of this, what is knowledge? So to come back to the Coca-Cola scenario, and if I can take you back to the top of page 45, just above um, 2.1, um, what is knowledge? In that Coca-Cola scenario, we thought knowledge was all about taste, but that wasn't the knowledge, that wasn't true knowledge. It was around, look what they say there, was not as high, but that taste was not a high priority as the culture. Do you see that, guys? Mm -hmm. So what is knowledge? Is it around the taste? Is it around the, and often you have to determine that in your, in your particular question. So is it about this particular aspect of that organization, or is it about that, that, that part of the organization? Does that make sense, guys? Very, very difficult to show exactly what is important in an organization and what isn't. But what happened there? They made assumptions. Remember in the, uh, this morning I said to you be very, very careful of making assumptions about things. Okay. And I love what they say there, that was crater over the years and that Coke had actually become part of the American culture. Okay, so it was virtually, uh, it was literally Americanized. Types of knowledge. Well, we get different kinds of knowledge. And um, if you look at the bottom of page 45, they say, given these myriad types of knowledge, what if anything ties them all together? It is the sort of question that is asked by those who study epistemology, which is the theory of knowledge. So don't get scared when you see that big word, but epistemology is just the theory of knowledge. What do we know about knowledge? Propositional knowledge. Now we're going to just chat about different kinds of knowledge before we can actually get to our questionnaire. Can I ask Brandon, why don't you just read propositional knowledge on um, page 46, please? In all the examples of knowledge just given, the type of knowledge in question is what is called propositional knowledge. Is that, in that, it is knowledge of a proposition. A proposition is what is asserted by a sentence which says that something is the case. For example, that the earth is flat, that bachelors are unmarried men, that 2 plus 2 is 4, and so on. Propositional knowledge will be the focus of this unit, but we should also recognize that it is not the only sort of knowledge that we possess. Agreed? Okay, so ability knowledge, there, there is, for example, ability knowledge or know-how. Ability knowledge is clearly different from propositional knowledge. I know how to swim, for example, but I do not thereby know a set of propositions about how to swim. And once again, semantics, if I say I know how to swim, can I tell you another story that dates back to my um, school, schooling years? Do you mind? Mm -hmm. So um, I'm busy teaching. And I was doing physical education at this particular time. And it boils back down to propositional knowledge and ability knowledge. And I was very much, at that particular time of the day, I was testing ability knowledge, the ability of the children to be able to swim across a width of a pool. So what happened, one of the grade teachers, you know the gradies, the, the littlies? The teacher was sick and she asked me, please, can I, take, can I take that particular class? Now, you have to be very careful with those kids. Because obviously there can be drownings, that type of thing, so you have to watch them all the time. You're not allowed to be in the pool with them, you have to be outside of the pool with them. So all of these variables have to be noted. And what we used to do is we had this long stick, 
don't worry, I never hit the kids, but this long stick, and we had insulation tape. You know what insulation tape is? So I would walk next to the pool, and I'd have the stick, and if the kid got into trouble, I'd put it in the water, and the kid could grab on the stick. You with me? And we had lane ropes width weights, so the kids could hang on the lane ropes as well. Anyway, so we're busy swimming, and I said to the kids, right, the kids that can't swim, please make sure you're close to me, you can grab on the stick, da-da-da-da-da, and little, little, little black boy. And the reason why I say black again, not racist, I'm showing you the difference between terminologies, cultural groups, and assumptions. So what I did, everyone swim? Yes, I can swim. Ability and um, what they're talking about, propos propositional knowledge. I, I, I can swim. My idea of, of swimming is this. Kids jump in, and this little black boy jumps in. And you know when you think somebody's making, just fooling around? And I thought, okay, now he's fooling around. And the next thing I thought, no, I think this kid thinks he's Jesus because he's walking under the water. Yeah. And he didn't come up. And I jumped in clothes and all, and I pulled this kid up. And I said to him, I thought you said you can swim. And he said, so did I. So did I. Okay. So it comes back to ability knowledge and propositional knowledge. Okay. Just because you've got propositional knowledge of something, it doesn't mean you have the ability to do that particular thing. Okay. Make sense, guys? So do you understand the difference between ability knowledge and propositional knowledge? Okay. Right, 2.1.2 on page 47 talks about two basic requirements for knowledge. The two basic requirements, very interesting this guys, for knowledge are truth and belief. Truth and belief, isn't that interesting? So it says there, when we talk about knowledge, we will have propositional knowledge in mind unless explicitly stated otherwise. So we need truth and belief. Two things that just about every epistemologist agrees on are that a prerequisite for possessing knowledge is that one has to have a belief in the rele relevant proposition and that that belief must be true. Look at this, guys, and then it says and that, that the belief must be true. So if you know that Paris is the capital of France, then you must believe that this is the case and your belief must also be true. It's contradictory, eh? Because you must know it and your belief must also be true. And then, if, you're, if you believe it, and your belief is true, then that's knowledge. That's what they're saying. Um, uh, I live in Johannesburg. I live in Johannesburg, and therefore it is true, because I believe it. It's a fact, it's the truth, and therefore it's knowledge. You with me? Um, listen to this one. Just think about knowledge that, that um, I'm a Christian, I believe in God. Is that knowledge? Because it's, because it's my belief, is it true? It, it's not necessarily true, it's my belief. You with me? So if I say I'm a Christian, I believe that there's a God, it, it's my belief, but it doesn't make it true. You with me? And therefore, in order for you to believe, your belief must be true. So now, Quite scary. The question also it's true to me. Yeah. It's true to me. Yeah. So is it knowledge to me? But is it, is it going to be taken as knowledge to other people? Because what about an agnostic or an atheist? But just because... Because how do you prove that there, that there is a God? Uh, it's a difficult one, guys. Yeah. Mandy? It's difficult, eh? It's very, very difficult. And that's why from a stats point of view, from a statistical point of view, it's very difficult to remain neutral. Because often you've got emotional ties to this particular information, correct? But you have to remain neutral. So from a knowledge point of view, if something, if you want it to be knowledge, what did they say there? I'll say it again, I'll read it again. You must believe that it is, it is the case and your belief must also be true. So we know that Paris, uh, sorry, I know that Paris is the capital, uh, capital of France and I believe it. And is my belief true? Yes, it's a factual statement. I can go to Paris and I can find that out, okay? It's a factual statement. There's no, there's, there's, there's no discrepancy about that. Okay. Sorry, Joe, you, you mentioned something? Uh, I, I wanted to say this. Uh, so the testing of, um, of truth becomes uh, important in the whole thing. In the knowledge scenario, yes. Yeah, exactly. It's in um, ascertaining that it is knowledge, like you said, it's uh, 
you can go to Paris and see that it's the best for every time it's not used. Yes. yes. But I think with religion it becomes... It's very, it's very difficult, guys, but that's what I'm saying to you. And that's why there's always this argument, and we can talk about this for weeks and weeks and weeks, guys, and we can still not get to an exact answer. So if sorry. You said, so, so said uh, if you go to Paris or France and you can live for wherever, and that's knowledge. So you can as well say that, well, for Christian, if you believe there's God, you can as well go to the Bible and say there's knowledge. Okay, a uh, point taken. Uh, guys, I don't want to get into a religious debate. What I'm saying is, remember we spoke about intrinsic value and instrumental value. Okay, something that is, that, that is there. It's tangible. I can feel it. So I can go to the Eiffel Tower, I can go to Paris, and I can feel it's there. But from, a, from, a, from an intangible uh, uh, knowledge base, it's very difficult to prove that something like that exists. Okay. So, I don't want to say about religion, mm -hmm. but I'm saying this is an interpretation, though. It's, it can be either way. So, knowledge and knowledge can be anything. So, um, so, to our knowledge, they say the pyramids was built by man. Okay. Now, that's what they say is a fact. But is it a fact? Do we know? We weren't living in that time, so do we believe it? Is it true? It's so contradictory. It's such an interpretation. Mm. It can so, when does knowledge become contradictory? So, because mm. it can be belief and truth at the same time, but it's your truth. But my truth is, no man, you weren't living there, there was machinery there. I can have that debate. And I can say this is the fact that proves that there was machinery So in other words, what we're saying is that certain knowledge is 100% accurate, but other knowledge is not necessarily 100% accurate. A lot of it is speculative. Okay. okay. So Paris, the Paris scenario, that's 100% correct, because I can do that. But the pyramids, to a certain extent, I can say, no, it's 100% fact, but that's my opinion. But uh, in actual fact, if we look at the factual information, maybe it's only 90% and 10% speculative because it was they were built 3,000 years ago. So point taken, I hear you. It's a difficult one and highly contradictory because I know as soon as you talk, start talking about uh, Christianity or religion, people will get their backs up. Okay, and I'm doing it on purpose. Why? Just to show you you need that neutrality and it's difficult. If you're a researcher talking about a particular and you're gathering information and you don't like the information that you're getting, are you going to start skewing that information? It happens. It happens. Okay. So just be 100%. Okay. So that whole thing about truth and belief. Truth, take the truth requirement first. In order to assess this claim, consider what would follow if we drop this requirement. In particular, is it plausible to suppose that one could know a false proposition? Look at the words, guys. You know a false proposition. Einstein's theory of relativity. I know that for every action is an equal and opposite reaction. Now all of a sudden scientists are coming to the floor for and saying, no, that's not right. So I knew a truth that wasn't true. Quite scary, eh? And for me it was, it, it was real. So imagine those poor guys in the 16th century. We can laugh about it now. They knew that the earth was flat and they were going to fall off the earth. And the next thing they discovered, hang on a second, it's actually round. I can sail and sail and sail and I'll never ever fall off the earth. Okay? How did that shake their belief structure? Because for them that was knowledge. It was truth. Okay? And they believed it. But then that structure changed. Okay? Right. Of course we often think that we know something and then it turns out that we were wrong. But that's just to say that we didn't re really know it in the first place. Have you been there? I've been there lots of times where you think you know something beyond a shadow of a doubt. And something happens and you realize and you say, hang on a second, you know what, I actually knew very little. If anything. Okay. Could we genuinely know a false proposition? I love that. Could we genuinely know a false proposition? Mandy, what do you think? Is it possible? It's plausible, correct? It is plausible. Could I know, for example, that the moon is made of cheese, even though it manifestly isn't? I take it that when we talk of something having knowledge, we mean to e exclude such a possibility. You know, what, you know what comes to mind with all of this? That movie, I forget what it was called, with uh, Jim Carrey in, where he basically wakes up and he's in one big room, and they're all watching his laugh, and he believes this is his laugh. The Truman Show, in, in, interesting, yeah, okay, it was The Truman Show, uh, did anyone see that? I didn't really enjoy the movie, but literally he's in this huge big factory, yeah, and it looks like, a, like his world, and he believes, and he, he has, uh, that's his knowledge base, this is his world, 
but in actual, in actual fact it's all a lie. Okay, so it was around that particular principle. Just look on page 48, I love this particular statement. It says, this is because to ascribe knowledge to someone is to credit that person with the achievement of having got things right. And that means that what we regard that person as knowing had better not be false, but true. Oh, belief. Why don't you read for me please, Tamba? Isn't that interesting? So knowledge requires a belief structure rather than belief undermining knowledge. Really, really contradictory, eh? Are you guys going to sleep? It's quite, uh, quite over the top, this, eh? Okay, but I want you to think about this. I'm going to, I'm not going to read through all of this verbatim, otherwise in about 10 minutes time, everyone's going to have their head on the table. But um, 49, look at page 49, it says knowing versus merely getting it right. I want you to do some reading tonight, okay, for me. Knowing and getting it right. Go through these statements, just, just paraphrase, look through those, through those notes, and I want you to get to uh, page 52, a brief remark about truth. It's a very important one, I just want to go through that. And it says, let's end this section by commenting a little more on truth. After all, the reader might be tempted to observe that it is odd that we have taken our understanding of truth as given and gone straight ahead to examine knowledge. Do we really have a better grip on what truth is than on what knowledge is? So what is truth and what is knowledge? Is it easier to understand truth or is it easier to understand knowledge? What do you think? Easier to understand truth. What do you think? Truth. Truth. What do you think? Truth. 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 Okay. Knowledge. I, I, I kind of say knowledge, but I, okay, you, you, guys, you guys say tr truth. The, I'll elaborate on my knowledge. I would say it's easier to understand or to believe in knowledge. Why? Because I can test it. How do you test the truth? Maybe also through knowledge, but certain truths you can't test. You just have to believe. You with me? Okay, so uh, very, very interesting. I find that very interesting. And then most of us uncritically take this conception of truth as obvious, but there are some philosophers who think that this view of truth is unsustainable. Unsustainable, that we cannot just go backwards and forwards like this. The value of knowledge, very, very important. This is for requirement one, guys. Requirement one, this is what we're starting to talk about here. Can I ask uh, Sasha, won't you read for us, please? I just want to confirm you on page 52, right? Yes, 53 now. The value of knowledge at the top, yeah. Uh, one of the questions that are very rarely asked in epistemology <laughs> concerns what it is perhaps the most central issue of this area of philosophy. It is this, why should we care about whether or not we have knowledge? Just look at that question again. Ask it to yourself again. Why should we care about whether or not we have knowledge? Is that an important question to ask yourself, Emmanuel? Definitely. We would all be living in the bush and maybe carrying around skins if we didn't ask that question. Would you agree with that statement? Definitely. That's how we grow. Carry on. Put another way. Is knowledge valuable and if so, why? Okay. So is knowledge, let's, let's ask the question, is knowledge valuable? Why? Only you can own it oh, because it's true. Interesting point, okay? Excellent, I like that, okay. So why do we need knowledge to make a decision? Mandy, you're... Sorry? Growth, growth, definitely, to grow. 
We cannot grow without a knowledge base. How do we learn as individuals? How do we learn? learn? Through experience, practicing, mistakes, observation. All of these things are correct, but we, we learn through from a known and then we move to an unknown. Isn't that true? So through experience, observation, all of these things, we start off with a known. So we know this and we're going to start there. And let's move to an unknown. And now we learn something else. And that's how we grow. Agreed? Okay. Carry on then, please. The importance of the question resides in the fact that it is only if the primary focus of epistemology, epistemological <laughs> theorizes, for example, knowledge, is valuable that the so only if the if the example so this example is knowledge if that is valuable then that epistemological enterprise in itself is a worthwhile undertaking yeah there's lots of tongue twisters here eh? in this unit we will examine this issue in more de detail and discover perhaps surprisingly that listen to this highlight this for me the value of knowledge is far from obvious and haven't we already found that out the value of knowledge is far from obvious okay the instrumental value of true belief I'm jumping down just to the second paragraph there and it says truth in one's beliefs is at least minimally valuable in the sense that all other things being equal at any rate true beliefs are better than false ones because having true beliefs enables us to fill one's goals isn't that so true so we sit down and we say, okay, this is my belief structure. Even if Richard doesn't agree with me or Temba doesn't agree with me, that's fine. The, this is my belief structure and as a result of my belief structure being firm, I can therefore achieve my goals. Does that make sense, guys? Okay. So that's why through tolerance we can have Hindu people in a group. We can have Jewish people in a group. We can have Christians. We can have Muslims. We can have atheists. We can have a, 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 agnostics in a, in a particular group because we've got that belief structure that we feel s uh, strong and um, uh, grounded in our belief structure and as a result of that we are able to achieve our particular goals. Does, does that make sense guys? Okay. But I thought you were shaking your head. Makes sense? Okay. <laughs> Simply right? Why don't you read the, the last, the last uh, paragraph there, page 53, this sort of value? It's very consistent with the fact that it enables us to find something of importance for us. For example, what the temperature is. Right. Please just look at the overhead there and look at, look at uh, requirement one. Discuss examples of intrinsic value and how they differ from examples of instrumental value. So remember, don't forget about your PMA. Yeah, we are talking about um, instrumental value. So what is instrumental value? A perfect example of that is a thermometer. A thermometer. Do you see how that's instrumental? Because from that thermometer, it gives us information. And that information tells us about certain things. So let's say we were going to have a bra. We look at the thermometer and maybe we can see into the future. And with the weatherman, we can, correct? So we want to plan a bra or a wedding next weekend. We can look. Do we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that that knowledge is true? No. If you know the weatherman, definitely not. Because he says it's not going to rain and tomorrow it's pouring buckets. Okay. So remember, it's speculative. So because it's speculative, it's based on previous knowledge, but it doesn't make it 100% correct or true. Okay, Brandon? Mark his fault, work his too. <laughs> okay, guys. Right, if you turn the page there, guys, it says, in order to see the instrumental value of true belief, think about any subject matter that is of consequence to you, such as the time of your crucial job interview. It is clearly preferable to have a true belief in this respect rather than a false belief, since without a true belief, you'll have difficulty making this important meeting. That is, your goal of making this meeting is best served by having a true belief about when it takes place rather than a false one. Agreed? So if you really want a job, are, are you going to arrive at that job interview on time or before time? Yes, because it's in your belief that it will make your life better. Correct? If you get this job. But if you got there and you thought, oh, she's like, you know, my mom said I have to go for this job interview. Oh, gee. Have you been there before? 
We have to go for a job interview and you don't really want to be there and you're hoping that you're late and that the car breaks down. Have you been there before because you haven't? Well, some people have, okay. So, <laughs> if, if, if the point I'm making, if something is forced on you, does it become a true belief? I'm just asking you to think about the question. So can something that is forced on you become a true belief? You're saying yes, yes. But, but it could also have the risk of not being a true belief, correct? Because it's been forced on me. Think about going to school, in high school. Who enjoyed rugby? Who hated rugby? Enjoyed it? <laughs> but I was forced, and you know what? It became, it actually destroyed my true belief because I enjoyed the rugby, but as a result of me being forced to do something that I didn't like, it actually ch altered my true belief in that particular case. Okay, so that's what I'm saying. Often if something is forced on you, your true belief structure can change. Okay. So the problem, however, lies with all other things being equal. Uh, a clause which we put on the instrumental value of true belief. We have to impose this qualification because sometimes having a true belief could be unhelpful and actually impede one's goals. And in such cases, true belief would lack instrumental value. Isn't that interesting? So they're saying having a true belief could actually impact on our goals and not achieving our goals and therefore it, hasn't, it would lack instrumental value because it, it doesn't add anything to it. You with me? And that's what instrumental value is. For example, I'd like to look, to look at the example as well. If one's life depended on it, could one really summon the courage to jump a ravine and thereby get to safety if one knew or at least truly believed that there was a serious possibility that, that, that one would fail to reach the other side? Yeah, it seems a false belief in one's abilities would be better than a true belief if the goal in question, jumping the ravine, is to be achieved. So while true belief might generally be instrumentally valuable, it isn't always instrumentally valuable. Do you see that, guys? I'll read it again. So while true belief might generally be instrumentally valuable, it isn't always instrumentally valuable. Okay, <laughs> lots of thinking, lots of thinking, okay. So, you know, what, you know what epistemology does? It makes you question what you thought you knew about knowledge. And that's a good thing, because there are no wrong or right answers here. We just want you to think about all the scenarios. Remember ratiocination. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, guys, I just want you to go to question five, oh, sorry, page 55. And at the bottom of page 55, it says uh, that last paragraph. Can I ask you just to read, please, Nontomi? Okay. Moreover, didn't our agent who was unable to jump the rabbit because, okay, because she was paralyzed by fear, fail to meet her goals because of what she knew? The problems that afflict the claim that all true beliefs are instrumentally valuable, therefore, similarly, and I mind the idea that all knowledge is instrumentally variable. There is, there is thus no easy way of, defini of defining the thesis that all knowledge must be variable. Okay, so what they're saying there, not all knowledge is necessarily valuable. Look mm -hmm. at requirement one. Is knowledge of greater value than true belief? So maybe you can bring that into that as well. Okay, right, and then they talk about in page 56, as I say, you guys, you guys can read through this at home, but the value of knowledge. Look at that word value. How valuable is knowledge? How true is it? Okay, and um, I'm on page um, 58 now, guys, and it's in uh, just, just the second paragraph there. It says, it should actually just start from the top of the page so you know where I'm coming from. In contrast, imagine that you form your belief about where the nearest restaurant is by looking at a reliable map and thereby know where the near nearest restaurant is. Since this is a genuine knowledge, it would not be undermined in the way that the mere true belief was undermined and thus you'd retain your true belief. This would mean that you would make it to the restaurant after all and thereby achieve your goal. Having, having knowledge can thus be of a greater instrumental value than mere true belief, since having knowledge rather than mere true belief can make it more likely that one achieves one's goals. So what they're talking about there, I'm going to read through it, but they're talking about a person having a map to a restaurant. And they're saying, if I believe, if I truly believe that that map is true and correct, am I going to get to the restaurant? 
through their true belief. If I don't know how to read that map, I've got a true belief, but I might not, we've all been there, correct? Hubby, your wife sitting next to you, man, you start shouting, goes, you lost, correct? <laughs> I thought we knew where we were going, we didn't. We had a true belief that we, we, we knew where we were going, but in actual fact, we both got lost. And maybe the map was upside down, I don't know, especially if Pierre was reading it, I don't know. But uh, that, having that knowledge, having that true belief, so what they're saying is sometimes having knowledge can thus be of greater instrumental value than mere true belief. So having knowledge of map reading, is that not more beneficial than just true belief? You see what I'm saying? So knowledge together with true belief makes that instrumental value greater. That's what they're saying. Because what happens if I was looking at a map and the map was actually false? Um, Emmanuel was playing a joke on us and he maybe drew up an incorrect map. And we were following this map and we were, we were going to land up in Soweto as opposed to Santon because he wanted to play a joke on us. But we didn't know because we, we believed, it was a true belief, that the map was true and correct because he told us that it was true and correct. Has that happened before? All the time. Okay, so that's what they're talking about there. Okay, so if knowledge, if your knowledge base is strong, then it makes your true belief even greater and then the instrumental value is greater as well. Does, it, does, does that make sense, guys? Okay. Right, I, lo uh, I love this little um, uh, extract that, they, that they've put in here. I just want to read it. And it's around Plato. Can I ask uh, who would like to read? Anybody? So, Shalia. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Bodily exercise, when compulsory, does no harm to the body. But knowledge which is acquired under compulsion obtains no hold of the mind. Stop there. Just take that in. Do you know what, you know what Plato is talking about there? Bodily exercise, when compulsory, does no harm to the body. What, what is Plato talking about? Exercise, correct? Mm -hmm. Exercise. So if you exercise in that, it's going to do no harm, no harm to your body. But then what he says is, but knowledge which is acquired under compulsion, what is compulsion? Forced on you. Forced on you. Obtains no hold on the mind. So it no, has no benefit on the mind. Now you don't have to believe that. I'm not saying that is knowledge, but that's just a statement that, that Plato made. Who believes that? I also tend to believe it. Not all of you. Okay. But uh, interesting, interesting point. Right, uh, carry on please, Sir Shalia. Plato is one of the most famous of all philosophers. He lived, he lived the most of his life in Athens, which is also where he came under the influence of Socrates. 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 After Socrates' death, an account of which is offered in Plato's book, The Apology, Plato founded the academy, a kind of early university in which philosophy, amongst other subjects, was taught. Plato's writing was often in the style of a dialogue between Socrates, the mouthpiece of Plato, and an imagined adversary or adversary, on topics vital philosophical importance. In the Republic, for example, perhaps his most famous work, he examines the questions essential to political philosophy of what the ideal political state is. Of more interest for our purposes, our purposes. however, in, in, the, in his book, the Ethical yeah, in which he discussed the nature of knowledge. The nature of knowledge, okay. And this is very interesting because the question of knowledge obtained under compulsion can be exp um, expanded to, for example, history taught at schools during the apartheid area in South Africa and history taught in a democratic South Africa. Isn't that true? Okay, so history taught in apartheid South Africa. Can you remember your history? I remember it. Mm -hmm. What did we do? Year in and year out. Come on, guys. Mm -hmm. Which year? Year in and year out from primary school. <laughs> apartheid, okay, okay, you see, now we're talking about the millennials and the X generation. You're definitely a millennial. Okay, we didn't do apartheid at all. <laughs> Anglo Boer War, and I did the Great Trek. The fur trackers and the great track and the fur trackers, Jan van Riebeck, all the time. So in other words, that compulsion, that forced on you. I, I did it for so many years. I should be an expert on it. I can't tell you one fact about it. Because that, that information was forced on me and it meant nothing to me. And that's what, that's what he's saying there. So in a democratic South Africa, think about the history that the kids learn now. Nelson Mandela, correct? Apartheid, not, not all the time, but apartheid. My boy, nine years old, he comes back and he tells me things about Nelson Mandela, and I'm blown away. And he remembers it. He remembers it. Because it's not forced on them. Isn't that interesting? Okay. So that's what Plato's talking about there. 
So there is a considerable difference in interpretations, yet it does not mean that we are currently presented with the correct version. Think about apartheid, guys. So we, we taught these things, but it does, does it mean that we taught the correct version? And who says what the correct version is? So it comes back to Simpiwe, what Simpiwe said earlier on. Who is drawing up the questionnaire? Who is um, drawing up those stats? And for whom? And, what and for what purpose? All of those things you have to remember. Okay. Coming as close as possible to the recruit, uh, sorry, coming, uh, coming as close as possible to the truth requires an insatiably curious approach to life and an unrelenting quest for continuous learning in the search of true knowledge. I love this. Can, uh, I've just missed a couple of lines now. It says, a commitment to test knowledge through experience, persistence, and willingness to learn from mistakes. And um, obviously these are the Da Vinci principles and a recognition of an appreciation for the interconnectedness of all things and phenomena. Look at that, guys, interconnectedness. What do we, what do we talk about there? The, the, the integration of all of these things. Okay, so remember when you're drawing up your questionnaire for your particular PMA. Remember that interconnectedness. Ratiocination. Why don't you read that particular uh, um, question for me, please, Joe. Analyze the rationale of the interconnectedness between your business function and other functions and how you can apply research and statistics to improve the interconnectedness. I'm going to leave you for 30 seconds. Come on, think about it. Can you think of a scenario that you can look at the ratiocination and the interconnectedness between your business function and other functions and how you think it could be beneficial to your organization? Can you give an example? So sure. um, is looking at a specific department or so I'm just thinking like um, to look at the process and procedure thing, just say the project management office is in there. But I'll look at the same ones in access to see the statistics between the two and the delivery times and so on. So I can match apples with apples and also see um, what their process is and what ours is and how we can get up with their, and how we can take up with Definitely, 100%. So you can compare apples with apples and look at different organizations. Thank you for that. Anything else? Bianca, can you think of something else? If you bring in a, an organization, you have a marketing department, and you want to sell a product, or you want to introduce a product, and you can get the marketing department to go out and do research on that product to see if, will that be a good investment for the company, or... I don't know. Yes, no, it's a good idea. Yes, definitely. Okay, so all of these variables that are brought in. Andy, can you think any think of anything related back to the aviation indus industry? I think comparing apples to apples, yeah, but then taking what stands out in your business or what seeing seeing something what you can change to improve your own business while comparing apples. 100%. And look at the important words there, guys. They say apply research and statistics. So research and statistics. A lovely example of this was I was watching Super Cycling. I'm pretty not much, as, uh, I don't know if you've realized that, but a, a, a cycling fan. And I, I, I love the Tour de France. You love the Tour de France. Did you watch the Tour de France? Chris Froome, eh? Very good. Anyway, and they were talking about, look at that, guys. Research and statistics. And yesterday, last night on Super Cycling, they had a gent on and they spoke about the five top technological advancements in cycling. I don't know if you saw that. So it was research and how did they relate it back to stats? They said that, uh, like for example, the one was a skin suit, you know these guys? And they were talking about a shirt being the fastest shirt that they've ever produced. Can you believe it, the language? The fastest shirt and they had stats to go with it. And as a result of this shirt, I don't know, they had special ribbing at the bottom that kept it tight on the, on the body. And then the air flowed in and kept a three millimeter gap between the shirt. It's phenomenal, all of these things. But that's around research and statistics. How did they, how did they back it up with statistics? They said that the people that were wearing these particular docu uh, um, uh, shirts actually rode maybe three or five percent faster than what they normally did. So statistically, okay, so that was one thing. So that's research related back to statistics. So that interconnectedness, the one interconnects with the other and vice versa. Make sense guys? Joe, you're right. Okay, good. 
I love this. I don't know if you know, um, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, Daedalus, Daedalus. The statues of Daedalus. Anybody been to Greece here? Okay, you go into the museums, the museums are magnificent, okay, and you find these statues. And some of these statues, genuinely, they've, they've been around for thousands of years, and if you look at them, they are so lifelike. Now, this particular gent, he was, he was a, um, a sculptor in uh, Plato and uh, um, Socrates' time, and his statues were so lifelike, they said that you, had, you actually needed to tether them down, otherwise they would walk away, because they were so lifelike. And this... Aristotle, uh, sorry, Plato, he actually talks about this when he talks about knowledge. So I just want to give you some background here. The previous point uh, picks up a famous claim made regarding knowledge by the ancient Greek philosopher Plato. Uh, in his book, The Mino, Plato compares knowledge to the statues of the ancient Greek sculpt sculptor Daedalus, which, it is said, were so real realistic that if one did not tether them down to the ground, they would run away. Plato's point, if that mere true belief is like one of the untethered statues of Daedalus, in that one could very easily lose it, knowledge in contrast is akin to a tethered statue, one that is therefore not easily lost. So knowledge, how do we tether knowledge down? By proving, by questioning, interrogating, you see all of these words guys, and that's how we get a strong base, correct? But if you ever had, a, had a, a, a knowledge base where it's actually quite weak, just think about your personal, own personal uh, insights. Where you've got a knowledge ba base, but you're not 100% certain on, the, on this knowledge base. Why is, it not, why is it not really a strong base? Because invariably you haven't researched it enough. Agreed? You haven't questioned it enough. So the more we question it, and that's why often coming back to Christianity, what do they say about good Christian, uh, Christians? You need, you need to question. But then the downside of that, they say, you mustn't question. So religion often says that, okay? Uh, coming from a Muslim uh, tradition or a Hindu, uh, Hindu tradi tradition. Um, it's good to question, but then they say, no, you need to have faith. And the thing about faith is that you mustn't question. All these contradictory statements, eh? Right. But don't you love that lovely scenario, okay? To tether down knowledge. Do you like that? I love that analogy, okay? So the analogy to our previous discussion should be obvious. obvious. Mere true belief, like an untethered statute of Daedalus, is more likely to be lost. That is, it will run away. Than knowledge which is far more stable. Put another way, the true belief one holds when one has knowledge is far more likely to remain fast in response to the changes in circumstances. For example, new information that comes to light than mere true belief, as we saw in the case just described of the person who finds out where the nearest restaurant is by looking at a reliable map, as opposed to one who finds out where it is by looking at a fake map. Okay? Make sense? So we make that knowledge base stronger by testing it, by questioning it, by doing all of these things, by researching it, and that makes it stronger. Okay. Right, guys, if you look on page um, 62, I just want to pick up on a couple of points there. It says there at the bottom, They talk about a particular scenario here, and I'm going to just come in at the end. It says, for the most part then, if one wishes to achieve one's goals, it is essential that one has, at the bare minimum, true beliefs about the subject matter concerned. True belief is thus mostly of instrumental value, even, it, even if it is not always of instrumental value. So it's got the most instrumental value, even though it doesn't necessarily have to have instrumental value. Okay. So, why don't you carry on, please, Mandy, um, Mandy, sorry, page 63 at the top. I believe, however, it is better to have knowledge, since mere true belief has an instability that is not always conducted to success in one's object. Since knowledge in entails true belief, we can therefore draw two conclusions. First, the most knowledge, like mo um, most mo mere true belief, is of instrumental value. Second, and crucially, that knowledge is of greater instrumental value than mere true belief. Okay, and this year, guys, uh, the reason why I wanted to read that is it's related back to that requirement one. So I want you guys to have a very clear understanding of, of, of how you're going to answer requirement one. Is everyone okay with requirement one? You see that? It's around true belief, around knowledge. Look at the mark allocation again. It's, around, it's 15 marks. So I don't just want three or four lines. 
that, that question was probably you're looking at around 50, uh, around one page. Okay, because uh, you, uh, maybe even one page, one and a half pages. Okay, so a lot of people say, oh, but look, just look at that. We, we've been through 63 pages, and 63 pages is basically talking about the first point. Okay, it's, there's a lot of other things going on, but it just shows you your biggest problem with this particular PMA is synthesis, to bring everything together, because there's just so much to write about. If you go onto Google, you're allowed to go onto Wikipedia, correct? Good, well done. It was just a test. Definitely not allowed to go onto Wikipedia. Why can't you go and um, do a search on Wikipedia around intrinsic and instrumental value? It's not factual information, okay? Authority figures, non-authority figures can go onto Wikipedia and change it as they see fit. So rather go onto Google Scholar or Google instrumental value. Yeah, Google Scholar, remember that's from your pro professional writing as well. So remember, you can, you can remind me, what, what is the uh, brief difference between bibliography and, um, and uh, list of references? What is bibliography? Let's say I've used 20 books to, to research my assignment. That's a bibliography. But I only used 10 of those books in my assignment, cited it. Then that would be my list of references. So what I'm saying is that if you use Wikipedia just to get a brief overview of a particular definition, I, I, I do that sometimes as well. People might shoot me down, okay? I do that. Who, who does that every now and again just to give a brief, a brief overview? That's absolutely perfect. But you cannot take it, take it as being factual and true. They will give a reference and then you have to research, research it further. Have you got me? Okay, I use wiki, uh, wiki summaries sometimes. I don't know if I told you this, okay? Wiki summaries, if you've got a book and you just want a brief summary, sometimes they've got lovely, lovely summaries. But remember, authority, non-authority figures can go in there and change factual information. So I can go in there, let's say there's a, there's a medical term about a, a femur, and they say the femur is a, a bone in the leg, correct? And I say, no, 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 a femur is a bone in the finger, and I change it. Somebody can go on and read that, that the femur is a bone in the finger. And that's not true, correct? So just remember, you can read it, get a brief overview, but then you're going to have to research it further. Okay? And that would be your bibliography. So in your, re in your list of references, if I see Wikipedia, I'm going to have big marks deducted. Okay? But remember, that can make up your bibliography, which you don't have to give me. Okay? Right. Everyone okay with that? So requirement one, very, very important, page 63. Look at that. Is some knowledge intrinsically valuable? Look at that there, guys. Intrinsic value. What is intrinsic value there? Well, at this point, we might wonder whether the value of knowledge is only ever instrumental. That is, we might wonder whether the value of knowledge is always dependent upon what further goods, such as gaining relief from your illness, which knowledge, in this case of the correct diagnosis of your illness, can help you attain. Intuitively, this claim is too strong in that there do seem to be certain kinds of knowledge which have a value which is not purely instrumental. But another way, sorry, put another way, some kinds of knowledge seem to have an intrinsic value. What does this mean? Why don't you read for me, please, Tommy? If something, mm. if something has intrinsic value, then it is valuable in itself, regardless of what, for instance, it enables one to do. Friendship is intrinsically Valuable, for example. Give me another intrinsically valuable uh, um, item or an example of intrinsic value. So friendship? No, not food. Because food will be instrumental because we eat food and we gain energy from it. Definitely. Marriage? No. What about hunger? What about happiness? All of those things. What about money? What is money? Instrumental or intrinsic? Instrumental. Instrumental, because from money, we use the money to buy certain things, correct? Okay, to buy love, <laughs> which is intrinsic. Very interesting, very interesting. Okay, so um, I'm just going to read through this just so that you can get a further understanding of it, but if you, if you go to that bottom paragraph, it says, won't you read for me, please, Nuntomi? We don't value our friends because they are useful to us. Though having friends is undoubtedly, undoubtedly useful, but simply because they are our friends. If you have valued someone just what they can do for you, okay, if you value someone just for what they can do for you, 
help you to make more money, for example, then you wouldn't count them as their friend. Put another way, although there is clearly an instrumental value to having friends, they improve our quality of life, for example, the, value, the true value of friendship is not instrumental at all, but intrinsic to the friendship itself. Do you agree? Intrinsic to the friendship, friendship uh, uh, itself. So in other words, the true value of that friendship is intrinsic to the value of, of, of that particular friendship. So if the friendship isn't strong, is that friendship going to last? No. Okay, and that's what they're saying. Right, guys, um, if you look, I just want you to look at the, the, the paragraph just before your group discussion on page 65. And it says, variety of knowledges, uh, sorry, varieties of knowledge such as wisdom seem to be intrinsically valuable. Clearly then, knowledge is something we should care about, and given that this is for, it's incumbent upon us as philosophers to be able to say more about what knowledge is, and the various ways in which we might acquire it. These are the goals of epistemology. What is the, uh, the definition of that epistemology again, Emmanuel? Study of knowledge. Study of knowledge. Okay. Group discussion. Why don't you read for me, please, Emmanuel? Okay. In your group. Discuss why true belief not sufficient for knowledge. Give five examples from in which an agent truly believes something that does not know, as well as the consequence of such belief. Okay, a very involved question. Should we just do it as a group, yeah? Mm -hmm. Just let's read it again. In your group, discuss why true belief is not sufficient for knowledge. Give five examples. We don't have to worry about five, but just think of one. Um, in which an agent truly believes something, agent, a person, okay, truly believes something, but does not know it as well as the consequences of such a belief. You can give me an example. It might be religious, it could also be political, correct? Think about if I went around the table here, who's ANC, DP, <laughs> e what's EFF, EFF, yeah, EFF, yeah, okay, and I said, and it's a true belief, and I, say, and I say, which is the best political party? Am I going to get a lot of different answers? Yeah. Yeah. Which is the best religion? Which is the best uh, uh, movie star? Um, if I said to the ladies, uh, which actor's got the best beyond, or uh, whatever, okay? We could get, really get ridiculous here. But um, that group discussion, give five examples. If you truly believe something, and how does that, uh, the consequences of that true belief, Think about from a political party point of view. What are the consequences of that true belief? Say again, Temba. No, it's scary, eh? It's scary. Consequences of true belief. If you believe something to be true, there's almost no end as to what you would actually do to fulfill that knowledge of true, true belief. Think about uh, various supporters, strikes, all of these things, guys, and those are only negative aspects. But also think about true belief with regards to scenarios where people have performed uh, uh, unbelievable human, ac uh, human uh, um, activities to save a particular person. You know, I heard something, I, I've never, I've never uh, um, determined whether this was true or not, but when I was a teenager, I remember hearing the story. You know Hulk, the Hulk? Remember that guy, the Hulk, he had a hearing impediment problem. It's very big. I mean, if you know who I'm talking about. The millennials might, might not. When I say the millennials, the younger generation, but the X generation, my generation, us old fogies, we know from the Hulk, Hulk Hogan. No, not, it wasn't Hulk Hogan, it was called the Hulk. But he had a hearing impediment, and the story goes that a car was rolling down the hill, and um, his child was behind the car. Okay? It, uh, it had just started rolling, and he saw his child, and he ran and he grabbed the car, and he stopped the car. Now think about that, is that humanly possible? The car wasn't, it was just rolling, okay? So it wasn't mechanically going, it was just rolling out of inertia. And he grabbed the car and he pulled it and he stopped and he pulled all of his muscles here. He actually tore the muscles. But he managed to do that. Now look at that there, guys. The belief in knowing that you can do something. But what is the consequences of that? He hurt himself terribly. But he believed that he could do it. And he did do it, but he hurt himself in the process. Okay, so I'm sure all of us have got examples like that. Well, not maybe like that, but around that, especially if you look at your organization, where people firmly believe in something, and as a result of that, there are consequences. Think of Lonman, guys. Think of Marikana. Mob justice. Mob justice. 
think of, uh, oh, I can think of really bad things in that as well. I don't want to really discuss them, but hopefully we can also get to some good things. Because just as a result of these, this scenario, uh, um, uh, uh, um, bad things happening also, maybe good things can happen as well. Can you, can you give me an example of any good things that can happen as a result of true belief and the consequence being a good thing? I, I think that uh, having <coughs> that says that uh, people are inherently good unless proven otherwise. You know? uh, one of the people that we study here that this is just uh, watch. And if you look at uh, the fact that uh, you know, uh, based on that philosophy, you know, the, he has produced quite a number of uh, successful leaders, not only for GG, you know, but who went on to uh, also become CEOs and top managers in other industries, of which some were even competitors of, uh, of, of GG. So believing that, uh, you know, uh, that people have potential, you know, to be the best that they can be, you know, I think, I'm not sure, but I think it, it's, it's Definitely. I'm thinking of that young Muslim girl. Um, she was in Iran. There was, an, there, there was an attempt on her life. She was shot. I don't know if you know who I'm talking about. And she was shot in the face. And she had to have um, reconstructive surgery. It was in Pakistan, yes. And that young girl. And through that she had a belief system. And it was a true belief. And through that consequence she's now there's, there's a lot of positive growth that's coming out of Pakistan as a result of that. But as a result of her true belief, she went through a lot of misfortune first. Mm. Let's think about Nelson Mandela, true belief. Mm. What happened to him? He ended up in prison for 27 years. Not so great, eh? Mm. Who watched uh, this, this, this thing on, on the History Channel? Um, Eddie Izzard and Nelson Mandela. Uh, Mandela, have you seen it? Oh. Eddie Izzard, he's the comedian. Have you, have you heard of that, uh, Eddie Izzard? Eddie Izzard, is, uh, he's got quite a dirty, filthy mouth. But um, he actually, he had a true belief. And what was his true belief? His true belief that he was going to come to South Africa and he was going to run 27 marathons in 27 days in honor of Nandela that spent 27 years in, in, um, in jail. And uh, he came out, and the poor guy, shame, I watched the last one last night. What happens is he's got a true belief. He believes he's going to do it. But he doesn't really come from a running background, but he, apparently he trained for two years with this. And if you look at him, you see he's a, he's a relatively old guy. I would say he's around 45, maybe, maybe touching 50. But uh, to run a marathon every day for 27 days, guys, no breaks, eh? No breaks. And then what did the twit do? He didn't run it in nice knock tackies. No, he says no, he's going to run it barefoot. So he ran it with like a kind of flat sole. Why am I telling you this? Because it comes back to true belief. What were the consequences of that true belief? He believed that he was going to do it. After the fifth day, he was hospitalized and he almost died. Okay, so that was the consequence of his true belief. So true belief is a very powerful thing. It's a very, very powerful thing. And it can make good things happen, but just as it can make good things happen, it can also, also make bad things happen. Okay, and that's the consequences that they actually talk about there. Group discussion. We've chatted about epistemology. Look at that, guys. The, the, the theory of knowledge, and then what does it talk about? Cultures, the importance of culture. Do I have to chat about this? No. We chatted about this this morning and throughout the whole day. Culture, especially in the South African situation, is it, is it important? Yeah. It's very, very important. Okay. Especially, how many, how many um, different uh, uh, cultures have we got in South Africa? Languages well, languages. I like that. Languages is language a culture. So we've got 11, but how many different cultures have we got? We've got quite, I, I, I can't even, because you think about Chinese people that have come in, Nigerian people, are their cultures not maybe different? So just because we've got 11 official languages, does that mean we've got 11 cultures? No. I think maybe we've got different cultures. Even from an English person, maybe you get different cultures within an English uh, speaking uh, uh, fraternity. You might get, in, uh, get an Irish culture. You might get a sorry? No, no, no. Sorry, John. No, so even, like if you take the Tonas for an example, you know, they have different the the difference might be slight, but they have different cultures. Also in terms of the way that they speak the language. If you go to Mafike, where simply originates from, you know, and also where he grew up and also from where I come from, we are 
it's, it's a Tswana area, but we don't speak Tswana the same way. Yeah. If sure. you don't go to Kimbali. So the dialect is yeah, different, it's okay? Different, yeah. It's like Portuguese. Uh, you, someone from Sao Paulo who speaks Portuguese, uh, the dialect is different from someone that comes from Angola. Sure. Okay. Very, very interesting that, guys. Okay. So all of that boils down to what is important for a certain culture and that and what we, why, why am I talking about this? Because it's, it comes back to your questionnaire requirement uh, four, oh, sorry, requirement two, compile a questionnaire. If you're compiling a questionnaire and it's for Tswana people, you need to take that culture into account. Are there different dialects? Are there different forms of culture within that particular group? Okay, does that make sense, guys? Yeah. You need to take cognizance of this. I love what they've written on page 66. I just want to go through it there. It says the re researcher also has to be able to ascertain the environment, cultural values that can, be, uh, that can influence the interpretation of questions or recorded data of specific groups of people. These are some of the factors that need to be considered when designing questionnaires. Highlight that, guys, and put requirement two. So when you're compiling your questionnaire, take that into account. I'll say it again, environment, cultural values, and that, uh, that influence that particular uh, answering of those, of those questions. I'll give another word for environment as well, location. Location is also very important. I love this scenario. It says a German political sociologist sent out 25,000 questionnaires to workers to determine the extent to which they were exploited by their employers. The question was rather lengthy and included questions such as, does your employer or his representative resort to trickery in order to defraud you of or put uh, um, or part of your, uh, your earnings? If you are paid piece rates, is the quality of the article made a pretext for fraudulent deductions from your wages? Come on, what's, what's wrong with those questions? They're long? I don't even know what the guy's asking me. The words, such big words. Who are you, who are you, who, who is the question for? It's for a factory worker. Do you think they're gonna know what pretext is? Do you think they're gonna know what fraudulent is? So when we design these questions, it's very pertinent that we talk to the, to the audience that, we, that, that we're actually talking to. Have you ever been there before, where, where a particular question is, uh, is way beneath you and you think, gee, Whiskers, this is frustrating me? You been there? Mm -hmm. Or when a question's up here and you don't even know what the first word is and what happens to your intimidation levels? It goes up. Because you don't want to say, <gasps> I actually don't know what you mean here. Okay, so what, what is that about? There we're talking about knowing your audience. You can I'll put it in big letters there. Know your audience. So you have to, so before you structure that question, you have to know your audience. So if you're dealing with factory workers, it's very important. I'm not saying that factory workers are stupid, guys. Please don't, don't, don't think I'm saying that at all. I'm just saying that you have to know your audience. You have to set that language and that tone of the questionnaire at their particular level. How do you get that right, Brandon? Because it can be difficult, huh? I'm just trying to think, how do you do it in our organization? I think that's where your communication in terms of um, the spokesman for, the, for, for, for those particular, can I say, not clubs or representatives before that come on to be. Okay, so you actually have representatives coming into that questioning. Uh, okay. On behalf of, of the, of the okay. So I want to ask this question, can I ask it like this? And then they might say, no, 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 ask it like that. Okay, makes well, sense. It's like, yeah, it's like sort of a medium, so there's different mediums of uh, communication throughout the plot. Okay, interesting. So uh, I think that's a very, very valuable, uh, valid point. Don't you guys, I, I don't know if you guys see validity in that, but very, very important from a brainstorming point of view, if we're drawing up a questionnaire, requirement two, I don't want you to just see 10 questions or 20 questions. I want you to tell me how did you draw up the, 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 the questionnaire? Was there kind of a consensus? Was there a brainstorming se uh, session? Or did you just sit, sit behind a chair and draw up the questions? Does that make sense? The survey, <laughs> the survey researcher in this case was Cole Marx. Although 25, now listen to this guys, although 25,000 questionnaires were mailed out, there is no record of even one being returned. So how effective was that? All that time was wasted, and then I put in, in, in um, I actually wrote at the bottom here, the point that not one was returned, is this not proof that uh, um, there were high levels of exploitation? 
for those particular work, workers or a lack of understanding as well because not one person sent it back. Okay, very interesting. Survey research is perhaps the most frequently used research design of social sciences. Although the survey as an instrument of social research is very popular in South Africa, the way in which it is applied is contested. You see that, guys? So a lot of researchers do this, but the way in which it is applied is contested. Why? Because we've got 11 official languages. We've got people from Zimbabwe, from Nigeria, from China, from Pakistan, all of these people coming to the fore and maybe they speak different languages. And now we have to try and get research on all of these people. For example, securing linguistic equivalence in a multilingual environment with diverse cultures such as South Africa is extremely challenging, and we've spoken about this. Yes, Minya? Um, I think that it's not just the, the understanding of the language, and it's also application of the language in, in, in a particular setting that you've got to understand how that uh, language is ascribed, you know, uh, in day-to-day -day communications of people in order to be able to compile a, uh, a, a, a questionnaire that will bring forth results that are capable. 100%, 100%. Thank you very much for that, John. Right, page 67, I want you to highlight that paragraph, please, because this is what I've been saying the whole of today around the South African situation. Just read it for me, please, um, Simpiwe, to understand. Uh, to understand the complexity of doing research in a diverse and multicultural society in such a South Africa requires an extensive study and it requires several additional modules. In Western terms, it would be comparable to a situation where one study suffices to address the Dutch, German, French, Spanish, Portuguese, etc. Is that, is that difficult, guys? Extremely difficult. And I, and I want you to just take cognizance of that, okay? So we've got an extremely unique situation in, in, in South Africa. So if we're gathering research, we have to take cognizance of this particular fact. Make sense? Everybody understand that point, Temba? Yeah. You're right, Zama? Yeah. Okay, okay. All right, guys, guidelines for asking questions. This is important. Guidelines for asking questions before you even read through it. Think about your organization. Think about the people that you deal with. How will you ask them questions? How do you think you'll ask them questions, Zama? In my situation. Mm. In, in your organization. Yeah, I think the, the first question would be to test that the product that we provide to them is still meet their expectations and stuff like that. Okay, so you're going to ask, ask questions around product. Yeah. And they will be very specific, yeah, direct. Say that again, non -tom? Straightforward, maybe. Maybe language. What level of language will you, will you, will you aim it at? Standard English. Standard English. Okay. What is the standard of the workforce at your particular organization? Obviously, you're making an assumption now, but... Yeah, because, uh, for instance... The kind of service we're providing is technical. We obviously cover people with a certain level of education. Interesting. So in his questionnaire, he's going to have to make a certain calculated assumption that everybody has an NQF level 5 or 6 or whatever the case may be. Because we're asking technical questions around this particular machine. Everyone's working on the machine. Everyone's got two hands, so we can assume they know how to work the, hand, uh, work the machine. Because no one's lost a... Lost a, lo lost a particular hand. Okay, so we need to sometimes make calculated assumptions around questionnaires because sometimes it's not always viable to go and ask every single person, do you understand this, do you understand that, correct? Okay, right, um, just with that said, questions, uh, uh, um, uh, sorry, the first one was guidelines for asking questions. I'm not going to read through that, you guys can read through that. Look at 2.4.1, questions and statements. There's a big difference. So do you have statements that the people have to respond to or do you have questions that they have to answer? Do you see the difference? So in other words, a statement would be the food is great, poor, tasty, wh whatever, and you would give them a, a couple of options. A question would be how is the food, food from poor to great, one being poor, five being great and you would have intervals. 
Do you see the difference there, guys? Okay. <coughs> Look at the next one. It says open-ended questions. Now, this is a bit problematic, but some people like to use them in research methodologies. Can I just ask Bianca, won't you read for me, please? What do you think? Do you like that? Very situational. I think you people have to write. I think it's a bit of a some people might see as as a now they have to think and now they must think about the grammar when they write and the spelling and I don't know. Okay, I, I agree with Simpiwe. You have to be very careful. Obviously, it depends on the environment. Mm -hmm. If you're dealing with a university, maybe that will help. Maybe, maybe if it's directed at PhD students mm -hmm. or master students or sometimes even politicians because they like to hear their own voices, correct? <laughs> so, so, no, I'm being serious. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, if you, once again, it's about knowing your audience. So if you know your audience and you, you, you're projecting that particular statement or question to a group of people who like to voice their opinions, then have a question like that. Would you agree with that, Simpiwa? Yeah. But I agree with Simpiwa as well. And also I can add that uh, depending on your, your, your the time frame or your feedback, do you want it now or you can still give it more time to think about it? Right, a hundred percent. Because if you give people time, I don't actually like that particular. I'm not saying you're wrong, but I don't like it because if you give people time, what happens to that piece of paper? It never comes back. It never comes back. <laughs> so when you're doing, when you, when you, when you uh, um, acquiring research or objectives um, or variables from a from from a community or respondents, make sure you get the information back as soon as possible. And you're going to have to define as soon as possible. So is it within an hour, within two hours? But invariably, what's going to happen if the person leaves with that piece of paper? It never ever comes never back. Comes okay, I'm not saying never ever, but invariably it stays at home, the person loses it, and the tra the, 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 their train of thought is actually lost. So I'm not saying you're wrong, I'm just saying you must think about that. Okay. All right, guys, um, close-ended uh, close questions. Look at that, it says, in the other case, close-ended questions, the respondent is asked to select an answer from among a list provided. So how do you feel? One to five, and you select it. Okay, so it's very, very specific. If you uh, make items clear, just look at page 70, guys. I'm not going to read through this, okay? You guys can do this at home. Remember, this is part of your PMA. Stop me if you don't understand. But look at that, that one there on page 70. It says, make items clear. How do we make something clear, Mandy? <laughs> you also need coffee, eh? <laughs> because you're the only one that's laughing at that joke. Okay, you polish it, that's how you make it clear. How do you polish it? Clearly define it. Clearly define it. How do we clearly define something? Joe? Uh, you said it? Simple language. Guys, just kiss. Remember the kiss? Keep it short and simple. Keep it simple. And write clearly and directly. Okay? Not polish it. Okay. <laughs> so make items clear. Avoid, guys. This is a this is a a, 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 um, a touchy one as well. Avoid double barrel questions. Frequently, uh, researchers ask respondents for a single answer to a combination of questions. That seems to happen most often when the researcher has personally identified with a complex question. What's the problem there? They haven't kept it clear and direct. So the question becomes two complex and as a result of that the question is complex and now what happens you can't just give one answer did you ever do multiple choice at school and there was a b c d e f and all of a sudden you thought gee whiskers there's a actually and b and c and d but there's only an uh, only an option for a okay it's that kind of thing if your question is too complex it confuses the respondent make sense okay right um if you look at the next point they bring up there, they, res they say respondents must be competent to answer. Put in big letters, uh, big words above that. Know your audience. Agreed? Because if I know that I'm directing this at a PhD group or at a master's group or at an NQF level 5 or NQF level 6, I, I can assume that I can structure my, my wording at this level. 
I can structure my wording at that particular level. So you have to know your, order or your audience there. If you put words in, remember Karl Marx and that, and that worksheet, that, uh, that, that question there, how many of them came back? Not one on record. Not one came back. Why? Because people didn't understand it. And you're going to intimidate them. Okay, so be aware of that. Look at the next point they bring up. Respondents must be willing to answer. So that whole idea about the environment that you're actually putting that, uh, that, uh, 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 that questionnaire in. Do they feel uh, intimidated? Are they exploited? Or do they feel comfortable to respond? Does that make sense? Okay. Look at the next, que and the next point they bring up there. Questions should be relevant. Have you ever done that before? Some twit phones you up. I'm a sole proprietor. Okay, I'm not bragging about this, but just uh, explaining my particular situation. What does that mean, I'm a sole proprietor? I, I'm, I'm, I'm an individual owner. So I, in, in a way, I'm an entrepreneur. Now, I can be, one day I can be here in the classroom, the next day I can be in a roof or, or in the roof fixing a particular geezer. Why am I saying this to you? I get a phone call. So I'm hanging from a ladder from the roof. And the person on the other side of the phone says, Mr. Goddard, have you got some time? No, not really, but I'll take some time, try to be polite, and we go through a questionnaire. Now, questions should be relevant. And the next thing, they're asking about something, and they ask me some silly question that is totally not even relevant. Okay, so they're wasting your time. Remember, you t you're taking up a respondent's time. So if you're going to take up that person's time, make sure that all the questions are relevant. And don't make an assumption that they are relevant. I like what Brandon said is where you, where you get a consensus of other people, maybe spokespeople coming in and saying, okay, yes, that is relevant. No, I don't know what you're talking about there. That doesn't concern me. Perfect example. Um, you go and you draw up a questionnaire for a group of people in an organization. All of them catch a taxi to work. And one of your questions is, Has you, have you ever driven a Ferrari before? <laughs> <laughs> is it relevant? No, it's not relevant. Okay? Some of them might not, they might even say, what is a Ferrari? You know what I'm saying, Simpiwe? But uh, sometimes these things happen. Okay. Right. Right, guys, 2.4.7. Short items are best. Once again, kiss. Just keep it short and simple. Avoid negative items. That's so important. I just want to go over that example that they give you there. Ask to agree or disagree with the statement, South Africa should not interfere in the Zimbabwean land issue. You see, that's a negative statement already. So a sizable portion of the respondents will read over the word not and answer on that basis. You see what I'm saying, guys? So just be careful how you structure your sentences there. And then number nine, avoid biased items and terms. Whoa. I'll just give you an example here. It says, um, prejudice is no ultimately, uh, no ultimately correct definition. And whether a given person is prejudiced depends on our definition of that term. This same general principle applies to the responses we get from people completing a questionnaire. The meaning of someone's response to a question depends in large part on its wording. This is true of every question and answer. Some questions seem to encourage particular responses more than other questions do. Questions that encourage responses to answers in a particular way may be biased. Now guys, if anybody's um, look, it's very personal, so you don't have to put up your hands, but if anybody has taken their child to a child psychologist, you will know that this is one of my biggest problems with uh, children who go to psycho a psychologist, is often they are labelled. And they're labelled because of the way the questions are actually structured to the, to the, to the child. So often if those interviews are, 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 are videoed, um, you can actually prove that if the interviewer asks the child a question in a certain way, the child will respond in a certain way. Okay, and you have to be careful of that because that is bias. Okay, and that's, that's, that's the point they're making there. Point taken? Okay. All right, guys. And um, basically the rest of it is uh, up to page 79, you guys can do at, at, at home. But I just want to look at the last one, 79. It says translation. Why is that so important? Especially for the South African situation? 11 official different languages and as Joe just said even in those languages we have different dialect sometimes one particular person from a particular culture might not understand another person correct because of their dialect I, I can't believe it Some, uh, you know my wife has got family in Greece and um, 
we we go to this family quite regularly when i say quite regularly maybe once every two years okay and the people in greece obviously they speak greek but they very they they, they speak english as well and when i go and i talk to them this is my cousin he says whoa, whoa, whoa slow down I, I can't understand you because even though he speaks english the dialect is different you with me so don't think just because i speak english and you speak english the dialect might be different and the person might not understand my what? Accent. Accent. Very, very important. So accent, especially Portuguese, correct? Sometimes they slur. Who's Spanish? Anybody speak Spanish? Oh, you put up your hand. I thought you were... <laughs> If you go to Barcelona and Madrid, people in Barcelona, Spanish people in Barcelona speak differently to Spanish people in Madrid. It blew me away, this. So I, I, I can't speak Spanish, but they lisp, they lisp. So it's Barcelona. It's not Barcelona, it's Barcelona. People from Barcelona. So they seas, but Madrid, it's Barcelona. But in, uh, in Barcelona, it's Barcelona. Interesting, huh? And the story goes, do you, know, do you know how the story comes about with that? Is that Barcelona had a king that used to lisp. And he couldn't say Barcelona, he said Barcelona. And this was actually told to us in Spain. And apparently what happened is the, the people felt sorry for him. So instead of correcting him and saying Barcelona, everybody spoke, they said Barcelona. Mm. And the dialects from Barcelona, did you also hear the story? <laughs> the dialect from Barcelona to Madrid has changed. So people, as I say, in Barcelona will say Barcelona, Madrid they'll say Barcelona. Interesting, huh? Mm. So dialect, very important. Translation, very, very important. Okay. Right. Nimpompo. Right, okay. <laughs> Nimpompo. Zuma. Okay. Nimpompo. Well, what's the correct pronunciation? Umtlanga or umshlanga? Umtlanga. A Zulu person will tell you umtlanga. But, person from, the, from Santon, how do they pronounce it? I'm going to umshlanga. <laughs> correct, eh? I'm going to umshlanga. It's not umshlanga. Okay, that's how the Santon people say.